This week on the Analog Circle Podcast, we get some information on Capcom's Resident Evil 9. God of War Ragnarok is getting Story DLC, allegedly. We get an update on Max Payne 1 and 2 remakes. I'm really looking forward to that. And Sony makes its first acquisition since Microsoft's purchase of Activision. All of these stories can be found here and a few more in episode 185 of the Analog Circle Podcast. I am your host, Keon Mitchell, and I want to say thank you for tuning in to another episode of the podcast. Now, as always, guys, if you want to be a part of the podcast, you can do it two different ways. You can either call in at the Analog Circle Hotline at 443 483- Three eight zero zero two eight one, or you can email the show, and the email address is simply the Analog Circle Podcast at gmail dot com. Matter of fact, I will be doing the what do you call it? The uh, feedback episodes of the podcast in about the next two weeks. So I want to say thank you to those that have sent voicemails and emails thus far. Trust me, they are not forgotten. I'm just trying to make sure that I can get my schedule in line to make sure that I can do it every single week. But with that being said, guys, of course, last week I failed miserably to get you guys out of here in an hour or less. So this week, I am going to try it again. Try to get you guys out of here in an hour or less. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the gaming news. That went down. So let's start with some remedy news. So we have finally got an update about the Max Payne 1 and 2 remakes due to a financial report where they have stated that the game has, quote, progressed into the production readiness stage, end of quote. They continue by saying, quote, We have gained clarity on the style and scope of the game, and we have an exceptionally well-organized team working on it. With these accomplishments, we are excited about the project and its future success. End of quote. Now, it was also confirmed that the two remakes will be developed on the North Light Game Engine. Just like Alan Wake 2, those joints going to be stunning. You hear me? But now, this was something that I didn't know. The original Max Payne games, of course, Max Payne 1 and 2, were a result of a partnership between Remedy and Rockstar, where Remedy handled the development and Rockstar Games handled the publishing. I was always under the assumption that Rockstar had nothing to do with Max Payne until Max Payne 3. And of course, Max Payne 3, one of the absolute greatest games in the 360 PS3 era. The story, the twists and turns that that game did was something, goodness, I mean, it was so amazing. Graphically, it was absolutely a Rockstar production. You could tell through and through. But um, just getting back to these remakes. Now, I did play Max Payne 1. And I thought it was exceptional. Matter of fact, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Max Payne was. It was the first game to actually ever put into a game bullet time, which changed gaming as a whole, almost to the almost to the same degree as QTE events back in Shinmu when that was introduced. And um it was just something amazing. Of course, this was around like the Matrix time frame, but we had never seen anything in cinema like the Matrix. So just these guys over at Remedy taking something like that, a concept and putting it into a game, it just really made it feel so cinematic 
for the time. It was just absolutely amazingly well. It was just well done. It was just amazing, you know, but the interesting thing about this story is that they did talk about, of course, the Max Payne remakes. And like I was saying, I played the first one. I never played the second one. I know he had some kind of, I think it was like a love interest um, that he had in Max Payne too. So I would definitely look forward to playing that for sure. One and two remade in today's graphics, the North light engine, I mean, just looking at Alan Wake 2 and just imagining Max Payne having those kind of graphics. Oh, my goodness. Could be absolutely incredible. And Remedy, shout out to them. I believe the last time I checked, Alan Wake was sitting at like a 9 out of 10 on um, Metacritic. It might have slipped a little bit, but those guys definitely deserve a round of applause for putting that work in. My goodness. They talking about Mac, I mean, not Max Payne, but Alan Wake 2 could be up for game of the year. So they put that work in. But that's not the only thing that I want to discuss dealing with Remedy. Uh, they also talked about um, Control 2, as a matter of fact, which I didn't even think that was a thing. Um, but they talked about Control 2, where Remedy reported that the game is in a proof of concept stage and said, quote, the plans for this sequel are ambitious and we have seen good progress both in the designs and in the game build. We will continue at this stage for the next few quarters. We focus on proving the we focus on proving the identified key elements before moving to the next stage and scaling up the team. End of quote. So it seems like control 2 is actually a thing. It's probably quite a few years off. I mean, them saying that it is in the, um, the, uh, what did they say? The proof of concept stage. That, that seems like it is deep, deep, deep in, you know, pre development for the most part. And they were talking about they're going to, um, they're going to continue to, you know, build the game up for the next couple of quarters. So, it's going to be some time before we see Control 2 or, you know, even any screenshots, I'm sure. But for those fans that are Control, you know, fans and enjoy the lore of the game, I actually have it. I didn't finish it. I didn't beat it. Um, it was something, man, the maps were just so difficult for me to understand in Control. I mean, I did love the, I mean, no pun intended, but I, I really enjoyed the Controls. Graphics were great. I loved their superpowers. It was a game that I wanted to stick with. And the story was even good from what I played, but it was just the map. It was, it was just such a headache getting around and trying to figure things out. So, you know, um, I didn't finish it, but it did win game of the year that same year that it was released. So, of course, I mean, just that alone says that, you know, it's a big fan base out there. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that, but, um, Remedy as a whole just has a pretty nice size fan base, um, that supports them and control to, you know, was no different. People that enjoy their games picked it up. I did, like I said, it was nice from what I played, but the maps really, really stopped me from progressing in the game. But bottom line is Control 2 is in the works, and for anybody that is looking forward to getting back in that world, there is hope in the future that you'll be able to do so. But um, they also talked about a project called, quote, Condor, which is a four-player co-op spinoff of Control, where 505 Games will be co-publishing the project. Now, this game is in the production readiness stage, man. <laughs> it was one thing I understood looking at this IGN story, because that's why I got it from IGN. It is a whole lot of phases that games go through. So, I mean, here it is. Like I said, they're in... What this game is called, they are in the readiness, the production readiness stage. <laughs> oh, shucks. Now, they did say, quote, 
we have acquired valuable insights into developing service based games. So there it is. We see that this is going to be a service based game, but um, they say service based games and are now in a better position to create a game players can engage with for years. End of quote. So yeah, it looks like this is going to be kind of like, looks like a games as a service kind of a situation for player co-op uh, spinoff of control. Sounds very interesting. I know we had heard about this a couple of years ago. Um, so they're still working at it, which is good, but um, yeah, I guess we'll hear about this later on down the line. Um, but lastly, um, on the list is code name Vanguard, which is another game that they're working on. Now this game is being published by Tencent. Now this project is, it is in the proof. <laughs> oh man. In the proof of concept stage, or at least that's what they're aiming for by the end of the year. Now Vanguard will be a free to play cooperative PVE shooter that combines remedies, narrative expertise and action gameplay into an immersive multiplayer experience. So it looks like they have. This is interesting. They kind of got a 50 50 split thing going. They got two games for games as a service. People that want to play co-op P- people that want to um, do the PVE. They have that four player co-op as well as well. Technically it's three different um, single player games. Of course, Max Payne one and two and control two that are also in development. So, I guess if you're going to do it, that is a good way to go about it. Make sure that you're feeding the fan base that is into your single player experiences as well as expanding your horizon and trying to bring in the PVE game players that enjoy those games, people that enjoy gaming online. And the the interesting thing, though, that I will say about um, this game Vanguard, it did say that Remedy will be combining their narrative expertise and action gameplay into an immersive multiplayer experience. So that could be something very, very nice. That could be kind of dope if they do it the right way, being able to get that that almost like single player story driven gameplay along with being able to play with your friends and co-op that could be a real good recipe if they can pull it off so uh, we will definitely keep our ear to the streets to the gaming streets to see what happens with these games but one thing is for sure remedy is very very busy and just to hear that max Payne one and two they're in that production pipeline the remakes That gets me very, very excited. Let's go ahead and let's move on into the next story. Now, this next story is coming way to us from Gaming Bible. Let's talk about the PS6. So even though no official word has been released on when we can expect it to hit store shelves, according to our forward slash gaming leaks and rumors one person shared that the console may be released in 2028 or later i don't think anybody is shocked by that um but to give this story a little more validity insider tom henderson man this joke has been on fire lately um chimed in and said quote understands that the next generation of the playstation the PS6 is unlikely to release until at least 2028. And this rumor corresponds with a Sony document, which claimed the PS6 would launch sometime after 2027. So we could have a possible timeline of the PlayStation 5 Pro uh, launching in 2024. And that's according to Tom Henderson as well. And PS6 launching in 2028 not to mention the playstation 5 slim this year that is a lot of hardware in such a short amount of time well i know what this week's question is going to be of course you guys have seen it already uh yeah we're going to talk about this a little a little more but you know speaking about hardware now i don't have a direct quote and i'm going to talk about the ps6 in just a minute but They were saying, um, and I hate when I say they, the executives, the lead guys over at Sony, um, were talking about that they are happy with the PlayStation VR 2, but, and this is not verbatim, but they're kind of cooling off 
on the PSVR 2. They didn't necessarily say they wouldn't be they wouldn't be supporting it, but they're kind of shifting their focus a little bit more. So it seems like the PSVR 2 might not have been as successful as they were hoping for it to be. And me, I definitely applaud Sony for trying to stay with the VR, um, to stay in the VR space. From what I understand, the PSVR 2 is a fantastic piece of hardware. I mean, it, it would cost a lot more if you would try, if you were to try to get that same hardware on PC. Um, so they're giving you the, I don't know if I would say bang for the buck, because that thing is what, $500, I believe it is. So that is a lot of money. I definitely won't be getting one until the price point does drop. But by the time I get it, who knows? It might not even be uh, supported. But um, yeah, it's just a ton of hardware that they're coming out with. Um, The PlayStation Slim later on this year. Um, Actually, this month, that'll be releasing. But um, getting back to the PS6, I would say by 2028, I think all of us kind of had that timeline in mind. You figure that will be eight years, you know, since the PlayStation 5 and the Series X and S released for this generation. That that pretty much um that goes with the timeline because 2013 to 2020 was the timeline from before and um that was uh seven years so yeah this falls right in right in about uh, where I think all of us would expect for these next generation consoles to hit but I will say I did think that it would probably be and of course this is not coming from Sony. This is, uh, you know, just coming from some rumors from once again, R forward slash gaming leaks and rumors, um, who was just one person. So don't take this as, you know, gospel that it's going to happen by 2028, the PS6. But I did believe in my mind that, you know, we're just really getting started with this generation. Of course, the first two years, it was a lot of shortages. People couldn't really get their hands on it unless you were trying to pay secondhand prices, which were $1,000, $800, $1,500, which I just was not going to pay. So now that these are, they're in circulation and you can go out to the store and pick one up readily. I figured that that timeline would get pushed back a little bit more to maybe around like 20, yeah, about yeah, when I say 2030, that sounds absolutely insane to think that it would be that long. Um, so thinking about it realistically, yeah, 2028 seems like that would be about the right time for them to release uh, the PS6. But only time will tell. And on the tail end of the show, we will discuss this a little bit more. But let's move on into the next story due to time constraints. I'm really aiming for this hour this week. We're going to see. But in quick news, uh, HBO CEO Casey Bloys has confirmed during a press conference that production for The Last of Us Season 2 will begin in early 2024. However, the series wasn't on the network's 2024 slate presentation, meaning the show might not release until 2025. This story I actually picked up from PSLS. So I was looking at The Last of Us, that HBO show, golly, what what a great show. I absolutely enjoyed it way more than I was expecting to. It really had me, uh, you know, not, not, I ain't going, I ain't going to cap and lie to y'all and be like, oh, it had me on the edge of my seat. Cause I mean, I kind of knew the story. I mean, I've played the original, but I will say one of my favorite episodes, there was a standout and, um, no, no spoilers. I'm not going to spoil it, but, um, it was the one with Henry, Henry and Sam, man, that joker right there. <laughs> oh man, that was a good episode. Tugged at the heartstrings too, brothers. But man, that was a that was a great, great episode. I, I thought they did that so so well, and just the fact that they had switched um, Sam's character a little bit, you know, because we know in the original game he's not um, he's not hearing impaired. We know that um, he can hear, but in the show, 
I did really love the way that they, you know, they kind of took a, you know, a few liberties and changed them up where he was hearing impaired. I thought that was just such a great change, you know, to the character. And, um, man, it was so good. So, you know, season two, I'm really looking forward to seeing, um, where they go with this, uh, what characters are going to be returning, what new characters we may see, you know, the last of us part two. Who that really opened up some floodgates right there. I mean, a certain character is going to make it through the season or not. It's going to be a very, very, I think it's going to be a very, very good season, especially now that I believe did HBO win a, did they win an award off of that show? I want to say they did, but I, I can't really remember. Um, but I do know one thing, the, the, the show was very, very successful. So maybe in 2024, when they start shooting, which is next year, maybe the budget gets increased and who knows, man, it, it, it could be so much better than it was before as far as the, the special effects go and, you know, where they're going to go with the story. So I'm very interested to see what we get in season two. And I am actually kind of not going to say I'm like heavily, you know, excited about the show, but I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what they do with this one. So, um, yeah, expect for this to be released sometime in 2025. So we're, we're quite a ways off, but, um, that's what we got on that so far. So let's move on into some quick news and actually got this next story from game rant. So, the once PlayStation exclusive Roller Dome, I tell you, man, Xbox is on a roll, man. But Roller Dome is coming to Game Pass on November 28th. And if you're unfamiliar, uh, Roller Drome is a, um, it's a game that, uh, how can I say it? it? It combines roller skating with shooting guns. That's about the best way that I could describe it. Um, it has like a cell shaded art style. Uh, the, the Metacritic, it was like a 79 and the user score was around like a 75. So it's a pretty solid game. It's a couple of years old now, maybe about close to two years or so old, but it definitely stood out. I saw it at one of, um, Sony showcases or one of their, uh, what's the other? thing that PlayStation has. I forget the name of it, the shorter show, but, um, it looked really good. I didn't play it yet. I haven't picked it up or anything, but it looked like a fun game. I think it's by the same developers that make Ali Ali, I believe. So if you're a fan of their games, the, the Ali Ali games, I think you will really enjoy this. But again, it's coming to game pass. They are making it harder and harder. I told you guys that I'm not getting Game Pass. I'm not going to get it. But these jokers just keep adding games, man. I mean, they just put Dead Space remake in there the other week. And they got Rollerdrome coming in. And Rollerdrome was a game I was kind of interested in, you know, but I, I don't know. Anyway, let me move on. I'm not getting long winded this week. Let's move on to the next story. So I got this story from Comic Book. So let's shift to Capcom because according to longtime Resident Evil insider Dusk Golem, Resident Evil 9 is looking like it will release in 2025 and is expected to have the biggest budget and longest development time of any of the Resident Evils in the franchise, uh, beginning production back in 2018. So it's also expected to be both a closing and beginning chapter for Capcom wrapping up the current era of the series and possibly taking it in a new direction as a whole. So maybe, maybe they concentrate on taking the series back to its, its, third person roots or mix the third person and first person perspective together. But I, I guess only time will tell. And, um, Oh yeah, it's worth pointing out that Capcom is working on a new RE engine code named Rex engine. So maybe this new resident evil will be the first game we see using this new tech engine i'm laughing because man that re engine sings man resident evil 4 remake looks so good on that engine 
Man, brothers, I mean, I was looking at, it was named Leon, I was looking at his coat, I said, darn, this thing really looks like leather material in this game, I mean, it looks so good, so I can't imagine what this Rex engine is gonna be, and that, 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 that now, now, that, that is interesting, though, isn't it, brothers and sisters, Rex engine, I mean, that kind of makes me think of Dino Crisis, are they, are they trying to tell us something, you know, some Consciously, brothers and sisters, is Dino Crisis going to make a comeback? I know Capcom has to hear all of us begging and pleading for a new Dino Crisis. Please make that happen. Resident Evil 4 Remake has been a success. They have sold a couple of million copies. So, I mean, man, oh man, I I, I used to think that, uh, who was it, uh, Blue... Oh my goodness. It's the team that Sony bought and I'm forgetting their name right now, but they, they were the remake Kings. If you, if you were to ask me at one point in time, I forget their name though. It was blue something. I know y'all know the, the studio I'm talking about. Um, but their remakes would be so well done. You know, Demon Souls, they redid, um, Shadow of the Colossus. Oh my goodness. On the PlayStation 4 look phenomenal. But these guys over at Capcom, their remake game is serious. These guys are really doing amazing work. And I love the fact that um, hopefully, you know, with the closing of this chapter for the Resident Evil franchise, hopefully it just opens it up, like I was saying before, to them actually making the next set of games third person. Because that was a that was a bit of a turnoff for me. I didn't get. Well, I did buy Resident Evil 7, but I didn't play it. I got it on a PlayStation 4, caught it on sale, and picked it up. Everybody said how great the game was, but I'm from the era of Resident Evil actually being a third person, you know, third person perspective, um, horror survival game. So for me, I found it very difficult to really get into the first person perspective of the game. So didn't really get into it. So hopefully this next set, of Resident Evils after nine or maybe nine starts to make that shift like this rumor is saying into a different direction. I'm hoping that they will kind of concentrate back on the third person perspective or the third person view of the character, especially thinking about what they did with Resident Evil four um, with that um, RE engine and seeing what this Rex engine may be capable of, because I'm sure it's going to have quite a few advantages over the old engine. So it just really, really gets me just that much more excited about what this Resident Evil 9 um, game will bring to the table. Um, but one thing is for sure, they're saying that 2025 is going to be the release date, or I shouldn't say the release date, the release year. So hopefully sometime next year, they'll start maybe rolling out some, you know, a couple of trailers here and there, a couple of teasers to uh, get us excited and hyped up about this game. And then maybe later on down the line, maybe showing off this Rex engine. I think it would be fitting if they're showing off this new engine that's called Rex. Make a Dino Crisis remake announcement. With this engine, I'm telling you, it would be, it would be marvelous. It would be sensational. But let's go ahead and let's move on into the next story, which is coming way to us once again. I was real busy on their website this week, uh, Gaming Bible. Now I want to take a sharp turn down Rumor Boulevard, of course, to discuss God of War Ragnarok. So according to one of Spain's biggest gaming sites, they're claiming God of War Ragnarok will receive DLC and it will be announced in the next two months. So that is very soon. So we're talking about possibly at the top of the year. Now it's being claimed that the source of information has been verified as reliable. But of course, with all of these rumors that we talk about, Take this with a mustard seed of truth. So over the next two months, even if they want to count November, so November, December, with, yeah, like I said, top of the year, January, sometime in January, may, maybe late December. I can't really see December too much because, I mean, of course, this is the 
holiday season coming up. You know, some people are going on vacation. People are going to be with their families or want to be with their families during this time. So I don't know if they're going to be making this kind of announcement that God of War is getting, uh, Ragnarok is getting DLC. So I think that it would be best if they did do it sometime around in January or February. And this could be a really big boost for PlayStation right now because I'm not saying that PlayStation is in a, in a, in a, in a low right now. I don't, I don't, I don't know, man. These jokers are having some situations. I mean, golly, Bungie just had to let go of a hundred people. Some people at Naughty Dog actually got let go. Um, reports were saying earlier this week, along with, of course, Media Molecule, which we talked about, um, in the last episode. Leadership changes, people getting fired and, you know, high positions. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, Sony needs some good news coming their way. I mean, dag, VR2 is kind of being put on ice to a certain degree to kind of shift in focus. It's a lot of things going wrong over at PlayStation right now. It truly, truly is. And it's getting harder and harder to sweep it under the rug because I am a huge PlayStation fan. I was once a Xbox fan, but like I told you guys, they just weren't going in the direction that I wanted them to go into. So I, you know, PlayStation became my, my, my number one, my number one console, but I would be being pretty disingenuous if I didn't say, you know, I'm, I'm raising a couple of eyebrows. As to what is going on over at PlayStation and granted, they have definitely, they have gained our trust to a certain degree because they always deliver no matter what they deliver. And that's the one thing that Xbox has not done on a consistent basis. And when somebody is delivering time and time again, you give them a pass. You're like, ah, man, I mean, it's. It's no big deal. I feel like they'll be able to make a, you know, a comeback. They'll turn it around. That's kind of where I'm at with Sony at the moment. But seems like every week they're getting hit with different reports of things going in one direction or another that people really don't want to see. But, you know, so that's why I think that if this is true, this God of War DLC for um, God of War Ragnarok, I think it would be a nice morale boost over there at Sony to have something like this come out sometime, maybe early next year or, you know, even in the middle of next year. But um, we know what God of War does. It's an amazing uh, studio over there at Sony Santa Monica. Those guys do incredible work, you know, so we'll have to definitely see if this actually is true or not. But again, I just want to make sure that you guys know this was not from Sony. This is a rumor. So take it with a mustard seed of truth. Now, let's move on into the next story. We're going to shift back to Microsoft a little bit to the Xbox brand. So we got some news about machine games. Now, this story is from Game Reactor. Now, it has been confirmed that Machine Games is expanding and will be opening a satellite office in Sandsvall, Sweden, and the studio should be fully staffed by 2025. Now, executive producer at Machine Games, Jerk Graviston, Graviston um, said, quote, Opening a satellite office in northern Sweden gives us gives us the opportunity to recruit from the large crowd of experienced developers who are in the region and who may not have the opportunity to move to our head office in Uppsala. End of quote. So having more hands on deck, I'm thinking of it this way, having more hands on deck is a great thing. You know, while Machine Games is working on Indiana Jones, um, maybe this this new team that they're starting can actually start work on a new IP or possibly the next Wolfenstein that we've all been looking for. I can't say all. Now, I'm not saying all of you guys are fans, but I'm such a fan of uh, Wolfenstein now, you know, being under Machine Games. I think that would be wonderful. Um, but it just shows that Microsoft, man, they are really on the move right now. I'm telling you, Xbox is coming. 
Xbox is coming. Here they are expanding again, getting ready to get another team. They're going to be fully staffed by 2025 over at Machine Games. I mean, what does, how many studios does Microsoft have at this point? 150? These jokers got a thousand studios right now. I think the official count was something like, um, and I might get it wrong, but something like 40 studios somewhere around there. This is, this is a major situation that could happen. I mean, you get so many studios. Here you got, God dog, put this in perspective. You got them over there at Xbox. They have ABK. They got Activision. Activision. Of course, this Call of Duty that just released, that ain't, that ain't looking too kosher right now. Joe was talking about you can beat it within three and four hours. I don't know about all that, but God, dog, that's, that's, that's kind of a bad look. Uh, but nonetheless, they have ABK and they have Bethesda and then they have their other studios that they've had before. 343, of course, they have not. Well, I've heard that this new season of Halo has been excellent. But um, if you're talking about their track record as a whole, they they have not been as effective. Looks like they are kind of and, and they're coming into a good position, it seems like, because ever since Barney Ross. You know, had to, um, yeah, they had to get up out of there. I don't know. Things, you know, today are looking on the up and up. And all you can go by is the, the trajectory of what's going on today. Of course, the past is extremely important, but I think it would be, you know, not fair. I think it would be unfair to continue to bring up the past and not look at some of the things that have been positive, you know, as of today. So right now it looks like Halo is in a great spot. Um, they got three, four, three. They got my favorite studio. Of course, that game hasn't come out yet, but, um, Ninja Theory, I think those guys are going to be a force to be reckoned with. Um, then you got all of the other teams. I don't want to, you know, make this too long, but, them having all of the teams they have in machine games actually getting another team staffed up. If they continue to just hit the market, now granted, Xbox cannot come out here with some mediocre stuff time and time and time again. This stuff has to land. It has to be excellent. It has to be fantastic gaming experiences for it to really stick. And if they can do that with the amount of studios that they have versus Sony, it could really put Sony in a very, very difficult situation. Because I'm not saying that Sony doesn't have a nice amount of teams, but when you're comparing, you know, if you're comparing oranges to oranges or apples to apples, Microsoft far exceeds you know, how many development teams that Sony has in-house. So if they continue with this, um, if they continue on this trajectory of getting their studios in order and they actually start delivering and then they have Game Pass as well in their back pocket to back them up too, it could be a real hard day or a hard generation for Sony upcoming because I'm already calling it this generation. It's over for Microsoft. It got about three, four years left in this generation. I think that what Microsoft needs to do, and I said this in the last episode, just get your ducks in a row for next generation. Make sure that you're delivering. You got to deliver in this generation in order to give people confidence for the upcoming generation that is coming up. So this year, just continue to make up ground, continue to do what you got to do, come out with great games, come out with some game of the year. Um, uh, uh, K- um, what did, what did they call it? Uh, Game of the year, um, good grief, I can't even think of it. Uh, anyway, yeah, come out with some game of the year, um, con- contestants. Yeah, come out with some of them. I right, dog, I'm all tongue tied. Pardon me, y'all, but make sure that y'all are in that conversation for game of the year. I think they could 
take this whole generation, just turning it around, getting the ship right. And um, yeah, doing what they got to do to start to really put their sights on Sony to have a chance at really getting that spot. And uh, I got to say, shout out to um, Phil Spencer, too, man. Um, Earlier this week, I didn't write the story down, but I thought it was I thought it was pretty dope. That uh, Phil Spencer, they were about to, Microsoft as a whole was about to take all of their employees. I think it's over 200,000 employees. They actually would get Game Pass for free. And I think at the end of the year, starting in 2024, they were going to take that perk away and have them start paying for it. And Phil Spencer, he actually stepped in and actually stopped that from happening. He said he wasn't aware of it, said, no, you guys are good. You won't have to worry about paying for it for 2024. I apologize, you know, for any of the inconvenience or anything like that. And I'm like, dag, man. It's, it's, it's really hard to dislike a person that does something like that. You know, I haven't done this in a while, but Phil Spencer. Yeah, I'll give you a round of applause for that one, brother. Man, that was, that was stand up. That was a stand up thing to do. Man, yeah. So anyway, uh, shout out to Phil Spencer for that. And, uh, yeah, um, shout out to them for expanding machine games. Let's move on to the next story. So in more news, Spider-Man 2 creative director, Brian, it, yeah, I'm about to have a hard time with this name. Intihar It's spelled I N T I H A R N T R, uh, has confirmed in a kind of funny spoiler cast that, the upcoming game from Insomniac Wolverine will take place in Earth 1048, which is the Marvel Universe that contains Insomniac's version of Spider-Man. Or uh, should I say their their versions of, you know, Miles Morales and Peter Parker. Um, he was then asked if that was the case. Um, if that was the case, why didn't Wolverine make a cameo appearance um, in the game. And Brian said, quote, there was a decision not to do it. I think for us, we wanted to let the team cook and who knows what the future holds. But right now, let's let them do their thing. End of quote. So could this mean Spider-Man could make an appearance, um, in this next Wolverine game? I mean, after all, Spider-Man 2 uh, core tech director, his name is Mike Fitzgerald, did say in GLHFS's interview that, quote, some parts of Spider-Man 2 will find their way into future games. End of quote. And uh, just for context, because this is kind of went, went over my head a little bit too, but for context, Earth 1048, is Insomniac's take on Marvel characters and Earth 616 is the main universe of the Marvel comics. What, which is why, um, the Insomniac games don't have to follow, uh, the Marvel characters story one to one, you know, as far as like the comic lore goes. So they actually have more creative freedom being able to place these characters in Earth. 1048 which again is insomniac's uh universe for the marvel superheroes which is dope because i remember this was a couple of years ago they were saying um golly what's his name ah it was a creative director it might have been um might have been if that uh actually said this but they were saying they were trying to create their excuse me guys their own marvel um the own Marvel universe to a certain degree. So it would be interesting to see Wolverine actually make, well, Spider-Man make an appearance inside of Wolverine. That would be pretty dope. I know a lot of us thought that Wolverine was going to make a cameo at the end of Spider-Man two. And of course I still haven't played Spider-Man two, so I don't really have an opinion on it, but I know I'm going to enjoy it because I love the last two. But everybody thought that at the end, Wolverine would have made some kind of appearance, but that has not happened. And it seems like it's because they really wanted the other team to cook. So this actually is interesting within itself. So while these guys, this team that was um headed up by Brian, 
um, whose last name I'm having a hard time pronouncing. But while they were working on Spider-Man 2, it looks like they were actually, um, it was another team. I mean, it, as far as what it seems like he was saying, has been working on Wolverine this whole time. So instead of, you know, going over there telling them, hey, won't you guys do this or put Wolverine and Spider-Man? It was like, nah, we just wanted them to cook. We wanted to make sure that they were, you know, able to do what, you know, they wanted to do so that they could pretty much finish up their game. So this makes me wonder just from that perspective, if this team was, quote, continuing to cook, does this mean that the rumors of Wolverine actually releasing in 2024 towards the end of the year, does that give it a little more validity? And we know that Wolverine was what announced like two or three years ago, sometime around there. And the way that Insomniac works, they are a monster. They're their production in such a short time that triple a production in such a short time period is unmatched. I've never seen anything like it. It's incredible. So I don't think that it is a, I mean, it could be considered maybe a small stretch that Wolverine would be out sometime during the end of 2024. But when you sit back and you just look at their record as a whole, being able to release three games in five years in a five year period, three triple a games, say what you want about miles Morales, uh, being DLC. Like I said before, that game was a full game. If you ask me just looking at that record, Man, I don't know. We may see something next year on Wolverine. And even if we saw something, I think that would be a, that would be a fantastic thing. Once again, just building up that morale for PlayStation 5 for 2024. Um, having some great things, um, to look forward to. So we will see if Spider-Man does make an appearance or not, but that's to be determined let's move on into some more rumored news now i got this next story from comic book so industry analysts and sometimes teaser dr sircon toto tweeted quote zr 2023 end of quote on october 29th So, of course, fans took that as meaning this was hinting at a Zelda remake. Well, now you fast forward to November 2nd, which was just a few days ago, and Nintendo leaker Zippo has chimed, well, has claimed, quote, the hero of time will return in the very near future, end of quote. And with this caption, he put up a picture of Link from the Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. Now, as always with rumors, take this with the mustard seed of truth. But man, could this be the case? Would Nintendo at this point in time, I'm going to tell you, if Nintendo and Nintendo is very savvy, they're very smart. They got some extremely smart people over there in their marketing team, far, far smarter than myself. If this is true, this would be amazing to release with when they put out their Switch 2. The Switch 2 being more powerful, um being closer at least from what they are now, but being closer to this generation of gaming. And of course, I'm just on a side note, sidebar, uh, Peter, hold on. I forgot his name, David Ledbetter. I I forget the guy's name over there at digital foundry. He was actually talking about, uh, the specs of what the Nintendo switch two could be with some new Nvidia chip. This being released. So just go over to Digital Foundry and get more information on it. But if this is the case, Zelda Ocarina of Time being a remake, you release that with the Switch 2, you are done. You are, you're going to be extremely successful because once again, me not being a big Zelda fan, I can't sit up here and lie to y'all on the microphone. I'm not the biggest Zelda fan, but I know the impact of what Zelda does. 
And you talk about bringing back one of these, this classic right here, alongside the Switch 2's launch. Man, you are going to be off to the races, especially if the game really looks good. But talking if it's like using Unreal Engine, I mean, that might be a bit of a stretch. I'm going to calm it down a little bit. I was about to say Unreal Engine 5. That might not be possible. But if you're talking about Unreal Engine 4 on a Switch product or, or just some dope engine that Nintendo has, man, this thing could sell like gangbusters. But again, it is a rumor. So... Take it with a mustard seed of truth. Now let's move on into the final story this week. I think I'm going to do it, fellas. I can't see the time, but I feel like brothers and sisters. I'm going to get us out of here in an hour. So earlier this week, uh, it was reported that Sony, and I got this story from Game and Bible. Man, we becoming best friends. Shout out to that site. These jokers got some good stories, man. But um, earlier this week, it was reported that Sony did make an acquisition. Oh, man. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. UK-based company iSize. That is the company that they have uh, acquired. So the company statement says, quote, iSize builds AI-powered solutions to deliver bitrate savings and quality improvements for the media and entertainment industry. The acquisition provides SIE with significant expertise in applying machine learning, oh, the machine learning, to video processing, which will benefit a range of our R&D efforts, as well as our video and streaming services. End of quote. Oh, shucks. Oh, man. So maybe... This company will help PlayStation's cloud gaming capabilities. I, I don't know about this, but one thing is for sure. I don't think this was the acquisition everybody was looking for from Sony. Oh, man. I don't know. I know everybody was hoping for a developer. I mean, some people were shooting for the stars. They getting a publisher. Sony is going to go big. Nah, man, they went with iSize. God dog. Darn iSize. Looks like these guys are into video and streaming services. And this is, um, this is a heck of a, uh, interesting point. Cause I think we were talking about it, man, the other week that Sony is, you know, it's rumors saying that they're going to be going into a video service to put into PlayStation Plus alongside their video game selection as well. Ah, man, Sony, this ain't it, brothers. This ain't it, man. Man, y'all got to do something better. But, but I mean, who the heck am I? I don't have millions upon millions of dollars to spend. I mean, maybe in the long run, like I was saying, maybe this will help, you know, from that video and streaming services standpoint, maybe this will help with their um their capabilities of being able to run their cloud, you know, the cloud gaming um sector of the company. Um, because I think it was a report saying that um and I keep saying a report, a report, a report. I wish I could cite the sources, but I just I can't remember. But um they were at the time pointing out that PlayStation's streaming cloud service could actually do 4K gaming, or that was going to be what it would, it was aiming to do sometime next year. So maybe this, this company who was again called iSize will be able to help with that, but only time will tell. But anyway, that is the end. Of the gaming news this week, which will take us into our next section of the podcast, which is video game theater. Yes, it has returned this week. And this week, we are going to take a look back at a classic. I know a lot of people wouldn't consider it this, but to me, it is a classic from the PlayStation 4 Era. We're going to take a look back at the Order 
1886. So after we get back from video game theater, we will discuss the question of the week. But stay tuned right after this. Is he? Is he? Stay with me. Come on, Izzy. Come on. Drink. Welcome back, man. That scene right there, that was like one of the best boss fights in the game. My goodness. At that time, Ready at Dawn, oh my goodness, they did that thing. I mean, graphically, the story, gameplay, the weapons, the lore of the game was fantastic. I got, I got to give it to him. I got to give it to him. Oh, my goodness. Ready at dawn, ladies and gentlemen. Got to also shout out to the um to the voice actor and actress in that. Um, Steve West, he was actually the guy that voiced uh, Grayson uh, Galahad and Alice Court, Coldheart, pardon me, Coldheart. Um, she actually uh, voiced um, uh, Miss Isabeau. Uh, or, um, yeah, the, the, the character, golly, anyway, man, golly, pardon me for that, uh, but yeah, the question of the week that I wanted to ask you guys was, um, of course, I know you read it, and, um, we're gonna just go over it right now, so, is a mid-gen refresh necessary? I just don't think so, I mean, I, I know that these new reports, are coming out about um, the PlayStation 5 Pro, um, 4.0 gigahertz, uh, being able to do all of this ray tracing, and it's going to do some great things. But to me, I think that we're just getting started. I mean, they, they're they just starting to kind of Wean off of last generation. That's both Xbox and PlayStation. I mean, we just saw that Spider-Man 2 is one of the first exclusives on the PlayStation 5 that is not on the PlayStation 4. And we're in 2023. And yet they're talking about these mid-gen refreshes are going to be released in 2024. I don't think that they've been able to get all of what they can out of these consoles thus far. I mean, even looking at the the uh, Cyberpunk 2077, the update that they did for both 
the Series X and the PlayStation 5, I'm putting it into perspective of how much better those games actually run when they're being, when the game was being optimized for those consoles. How much better of a state the games are in. I think that goes to show that this generation has way more to offer versus offering or selling a mid-gen refresh. Of course, there are going to be people that want the mid-gen refresh, but then I feel like we could possibly fall into a situation where um now they have to do a split again. They got to split it between what the PlayStation 5 Pro can do and the PlayStation 5 and then the Series X. And well, of course, Xbox said that they're not making a mid-gen refresh. The Series X is the mid-gen refresh, which is which is laughable to me. I don't know how that's possible, but it is what it is. Yes, the Series S was supposed to be with the Series X, actually. I don't know. Anyway, that is my question to you guys. Are these, um, is a mid-gen refresh necessary? If you want to chime in, you can do it two different ways. As always, you can call in at 443-380-0281 and let your voice be heard. Or you can email the show and the email address is simply the analog circle podcast at gmail.com. Once again, I, I gotta, I gotta give this, this woman her credit though. They, they did do the um, voice acting. In the order 1886. Once again, her name is Miss Alice Court, Court Hart. It's spelled C-O-U-L-T Hart, Colt Hart. And the character that she was playing is Izzy that she was called in the game or Miss Isabeau. Just wanted to put that out there. I butchered it earlier. But, um, anyway, with that being said, I was your host. Keon Mitchell, want to thank you guys for coming through. And with that being said, we will do it again sometime next week. But until then, before we get out of here and put a bow on it, always remember it is not about the consoles. It's about the game. So again, until the next episode, when we do it again, you guys take care. Be safe out there. Bye-bye.